I'm Ray Flores. Today we're going to be talking about Alexander the Great. And by today I mean tonight. That's Alexander the Great in Greek. It's that writing that you see up there. And all the great things that happen after, of course, he dies. So this is a nice little Roman villa, Roman house in Pompeii. This is where we found something that was pretty great that was a depiction of Alexander. It's a mosaic. Now this mosaic is in someone's yard where it was. And there's a replica in that yard now. But as you walk through this courtyard, you can see, you walk around here, or you walk around this way, and then right here in the back here, you find this mosaic. It's almost hiding a little bit. This is as you walk through. This is all modern, of course. And then you see me discovering this and being absolutely ecstatic that I found it. I was really happy. Had no idea it was here. Walk in, you see this. This is the mosaic. It's really, really nice. The original one is in the museum now. It's no longer there. This is a replica, but it's pretty exact. And this is the mosaic as you see it. Normally, I'm going to try to adjust the light a little bit here for you on your video, because it's kind of hard to see. Bear with me for a second. Okay, that's much better. The only problem is I can't actually hold it here, so I'll send you a link to that picture. That's the idea. What you basically see in this photo of this mosaic, a really lousy photo of my dad, is Darius and Alexander fighting a battle. And you see those big long spears that Darius has. I'm sorry, you see the big long spears that Alexander has, and you see Darius running away. But we're going to move along with this, and I'll come back to talk about that video later. I mean, sorry, that picture later. Mosaic. mosaic. I'll come up with the mosaic later. This is slightly better. Of course, it's wonderfully backwards. But as you can see here, you have these big long spears. This is the Magdalene family inscription that's fighting formation of 256 men of the Okay. As Greeks, you would fight in a phalanx. This is a sort of phalanx. But as Greeks, you would fight, you fight like this. Shields here, stab over the top. Stab, 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 overhand grip. And you try to get above the enemy's shield and kind of below his helmet, so kind of in the neck area. Sometimes you might be able to get a blow if he's kind of got his neck tilted. You could try to stab him in the eye. It was really hard to actually land a hit, but you basically had to get it between pieces of armor. Anyway, what you basically see here is, of course, the um, Macedonian version of the phalanx. I think I can make this a little... Oh, that's good. That's real good right there. You basically see the Macedonian version of the phalanx. So what Philip the Great did, or Philip the Great... Philip the Second, sorry. Not Philip the Great. Um, of Macedon did was he changed a lot of military around. Macedon was not a big place. There was not tons and tons and tons of people there necessarily all the time. But he was able to kind of get a little bit more united and made it really powerful because he made things like military innovations. And he got a lot of money. He ended up getting lots and lots of money from places that he was 
appropriating, and he found money in his own territory from silver mines. He used the money to make military innovations. Now, these are the military innovations as we see here. Really long spears. When you're fighting with an 8-foot spear against somebody who has a 12-foot spear, there's a difference. Now make that an 18 to 24-foot spear, okay? These guys are using 18-foot to 24-foot spears, depending on the phalanx, and depending on the length. But you see here, now this stick that I've been waving around is not more than 5 feet. Okay, so picture... This stick, okay, against, this is kind of a measure of the entire, um, what do you call it, presentation board pull-down thing. Now make that 15 feet long, and then add a few feet to the end of that. That's what you're dealing with. The spears are as long as this room. Now, you might be saying, Mr. Moore, how can you stab somebody overhand with a spear like you were just doing if your spear is 24 feet long? And the simple answer is you can't. And it makes perfect sense that you can't because, of course, you hold it underhand. You have to hold this underhand, which means that you can't hold a shield now. But wait, Mr. Moore, I see shields in the phalanx. Aha, and to you I say you are correct. They had small shields, half the size of the big ones that the Greeks had. I should say the Greek hoplites, as to whether or not the Macedonians are Greek is an open question. So they could carry the spear underhand, basically like this. Underhand grip, overhand grip, underhand grip, underhand. Underhand, underhand, underhand. Got it? Good. Shield goes right here. It's like that. That's how you stab. How are they so long? Especially because they're holding from the back, so you're thinking, oh, there's no leverage here. There's no leverage. Also correct. They had a big ball on the end of the spear that would act as a counterweight. So it would be heavier, but it would be a lot easier to hold because you have this big weight here and a lot of weight of the wood on the other end. You know, 20 feet long worth of wood. Now, the second innovation that Philip of Macedon... Oh, also, these uh, hoplites didn't need to wear nearly as much armor. They were much lighter. Of course, if you could make it so that the enemy couldn't even get close to you, that's a big help. That's not to say that they never fought hand-to-hand-to-hand, -hand -to -hand, but the need for armor is significantly less when you have a really long spear, and you can poke people at a time when they can't hit you back. Also, other thing that they did is they would be in serried ranks. So serried means like almost like serrated kind of thing. So you would have this spear here, and then the next person would have his spear like the, the person behind you would have his spear, and it'd be back here. So you have one spear here, and the front guy would have a spear here. Here, 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 just like that. So look, watch. Here, 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 here. Look kind of like the back of a knife blade, but it was like slanted. So almost like, see how these three fingers are? Like that. Just like that. And then you'd have five, so you, I might index finger isn't long enough, but you'd have five spears coming out in each sink, so spear, 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 picture two more, and then you would get another row of five, so and then spear, 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 like the long, so it looks like, as you can kind of see here, I know it's hard to see, but you get up there, you can see a spear tip here, and then another spear, oh, okay, that's a bad example. You can see a spear tip here, a spear tip here, and then picture another spear tip here, 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 here. And then see how there's a gap between each front spear? Exactly that. Excuse me. <coughs> Dry throat. Anyway, 
I really hope I'm not getting sick. I blame you guys if I do. Anyway, that's the hop out formation for you. What this means is when you go against another phalanx, of course, they can't hit you, you can hit them, you blow them away usually. If they can get in there and fight you man to man, they have to get through one row, two row, three row, four row, five rows of spears before they can start to get close enough to you to actually hit you, or actually hit your hoplites. So that's kind of tough. And yeah, I mean, as the battle goes on, some of these spears would break and things like that, but you can deal with it, essentially. It's essentially like going up against a porcupine. And in continuation of this idea, you get very unhappy Persians, especially, who fight with shorter spears. After the Pel it should be noted that after the Peloponnesian War, both Athens and Sparta are quite weak, and another city-state called Thebes takes over. Thebes is kind of like a backwater city-state. They're not very important for much of Greek history. They're always the third most powerful, and they're always kind of forgotten and left out. And a lot of the times, Corinth kind of takes that third most powerful position anyway, so they're sometimes even marginalized down to fourth. But, anyway, that said, they're always kind of in the Athens and Sparta's shadow, and to some extent Corinth's shadow. And, uh, they're all, but they're always trying to be, like, powerful. But they do stupid things, like they ally with the Persians one time when the Persians walked through, and Athens didn't really like that too much. Neither did Sparta, to be quite real. And, anyway... Thebes eventually gets this really great military commander whose name's Epaminondas, you do not need to know that. But he eventually takes over both Athens and Sparta after the Peloponnesian War because, of course, Athens is super weak after the Peloponnesian War, i.e. they just lost. And, you know, the plague killed a lot of their men early on, and then they held out for, you know, another 20-some years after the plague, but they were pretty much devastated, and they had no... Their Sparta pretty much subjugated them a lot, and let's see, so yeah, they played, deaths and warfare weren't horrendous, but they had horrible economic problems. That said, Thebes comes in, Thebes makes mincemeat of Athens, beats Sparta as well, Sparta is shocked that they lost, but this guy was a really great military commander, and he employed things like battle delayed freshness and advanced tactics and ways of getting his men to fight on more fronts at one time and things like that that the Spartans just didn't see as necessary or even that honorable necessarily. But the Spartans were shocked, don't get me wrong. Like the Spartans were really surprised that they lost. Um, anyway, he eventually sort of kind of unites Greece a little bit. But it doesn't really matter because a few years later, Epaminondas dies, and then after Epaminondas, you don't pretty much hear from Thebes too much after that. And then Philip II of Macedon comes through, the father of Alexander the Great, of course, the guy who's making all of these military innovations. And he just rolls through and demolishes pretty much everything in his path pretty easily. Ironically, in a nice twist of fate, the pass up, so he has to march down from the north, so they ha he has to go through the pass at Thermopylae. Guess who's guarding the pass at Thermopylae on that given day that Philip comes through? But the Spartans. And the Spartans, in the 330s BC, surrender to a man. They just throw their hands up and surrender, and that's it. 300 Spartans were guarding the pass, they surrender. The same thing basically happens in 490, so 160 years earlier, and the Spartans fight to the death to a man. I, how the mighty have fallen. We will continue the saga in the next video.